Welcome to the Center for Security, Race, and Rights lecture series entitled Humanizing the Other, which is the theme of our series this year as we attempt to bring the perspectives of individuals and communities who are often othered, marginalized, or outright ignored, and sometimes even oppressed in the particular context in which they exist, whether it's domestic or whether it's international. And today, it is my distinct honor to be hosting Dr. Lara Shiha uh, to present uh, our second uh, speech or our second lecture in the series. But before I formally introduce her, I, I'll introduce myself. I'm the executive director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights here at Rutgers Law School, also known as the People's Electric Law School, which has a rich and proud history of representing the underprivileged, the underdogs, the oppressed, and those who society uh, has systematically uh, placed at the margins um, of our uh, nation. And my name is Sahar Aziz. It is my distinct honor to um, host this lecture series and hope that you will, uh, by attending this one and the others, that you will support the Center for Security, Race and Rights by going to our website at csrr.rutgers.edu and donating to the center so that we can provide these types of public events uh, free to the public. And also follow us on social media at RUCSRR on Twitter and Rutgers CSRR on Instagram. And our center is focused on, or its mission is to uh, examine the law and policy that disproportionately affects Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities here in the United States, as well as the uh, events abroad that affect their civil and human rights in the US and these looking at these transnational connections. So today, um, for all the wrong reasons, sadly, uh, today's lecture is quite timely, which is the psychoanalysis under occupation, practicing resistance in Palestine. And it is based, the, the title of the lecture is based on the book that Dr. Lara Shiha and Dr. Stephen Shiha have uh, co-authored together. So if you'd like to know more, you can uh, read the, the book. Um, so it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Lara Shiha. She is uh, an assistant professor of clinical psychology at the George Washington University's professional psychology program, where she is the founding faculty director of the Psychoanalysis and the Arab World Lab. Uh, Dr. Shiha's work takes up decolonial and anti-oppressive approaches to psychoanalysis with a focus on liberation struggles in the global South. She is co-author with Stephen Shiha of the book that we'll be talking about today, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, Practicing Resistance in Palestine, which was published by Rutledge in 2022. And it won the Middle East Monitor's 2022 Palestine Book Award for Best Academic Book. Dr. Shiha is the president of the Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology. She's the co-editor of Studies in Gender and Sexuality and the co-editor of Counterspace in Psychoanalysis, Culture, and Society. Dr. Shiha is also a contributing editor to the Social Psych Psychosocial Foundation's Parapraxis Magazine and the advisory board of the USA Palestine Mental Health Network. And so we are so fortunate to have you today, Dr. Uh, she had to join us and explain to us kind of your expertise and, and the, the challenges that Palestinians face uh, and how that affects their mental health and, and the psychological state um, of many of the people that you uh, serve and that you've, that you've researched. So welcome uh, to the lecture series. Thank you so much, Sahar. Masal khayt lal kil, wa shukran ktir al wujud kon. So, uh, of course, I want to say a big thank you to Sahar Aziz and the Center for Security, Race and Rights. And thank you, of course, to the labor it took to bring this series together uh, with a special shout out, of course, to Habiba and Samantha for being so kind and pleasurable to work with. Uh, these things don't happen without a lot of work and a lot of planning. And I know that Sahar, you've put a lot of thought into this. So I'm very excited to be here with you all. Um, this talk was scheduled months ago prior to what unfolded in Palestine and Palestine in the past several days. I've given a version of this talk before. It takes up themes in the book that I co-wrote with my partner, uh, Sven Shiha. 
And at other times, but right now especially, it's impossible to give this talk without centering and reminding us how settler colonialism, and in this case, particularly Zionist settler colonialism, is a structure that is the provocation. And of course, I am saying this using and sort of riffing off of a lot of the loaded language that we have heard uh, ask it, you know, that sort of says that this all this happened without provocation. So I'd like to name that settler colonialism is the provocation. Settler colonialism is a violent structure. It's a structure of power constitutively intending to harm. That is, it's organized around the logic of domination, exploitation, and racial and ethnic hierarchies. The structure of settler colonialism necess necessitates a persistent repetition compulsion of harmful practices that displace indigenous life, intrudes on physical and psychic sovereignty, and physically maims or creates stability as Jaspir Bouar has taught us. The repetition compulsion is key, and yet unlike its Freudian origins, is not unconscious, but rather pointed, purposeful, and shored up by the juridical, the social, the political, the economic, and the relational processes and structures. And I know Sahara has spoken about this, as has Nura Arakat, of course. The settler colonial repetition compulsion is organized around a constellation of actions that aim to make the settler native, as Patrick Wolf has taught us, and to invade the psychic province of being. While settler colonialism relies on structures and acts of violence as its primary function, its hegemony legitimizes this violence to the valiance of virtues. This is what we're seeing right now in real time and which is why I'm fronting the talk with this sort of uh, entry point. And this is often done, of course, through mission civilitrice or spreading de democratic values, relying on moralism and codes of civility, indicative of what Heike Schotten highlights as, quote, settler colonial eliminationist ideology, end quote. The codes are therefore inherently ideological and they contour, among other things, who has permission to speak about what, and most importantly, how that speech is delivered, especially in the case of Palestine vis-a-vis -vis Zionism. For Schotten, this ideology is constructed in an unmarked matrix of savage versus civilized. Again, this is right underneath our noses right now, in which, quote, settler colonial ideology smuggles a highly normative value system into the polity, whereby only settler life qualifies or is properly recognized as life itself, simultaneously constructing its opposite, that which refuses life in an unthinkable or utterly unconscionable manner. Life here comes to represent normative being, a nod to Sylvia Winter's ethnoclass of man and the referential point which the normative boundaries of existence and therefore who threatens that existence are constituted. This is what we're witnessing today in real time in Palestine in Gaza. And in the midst of that, because my talk is about our book, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, and because I'm a psychoanalytically oriented clinician and professor, I'd like to read for you to hold in mind for the case that I'll be presenting from Palestine about what the World Association of Psychoanalysis released on October 8th from Paris. And these are their words. This is a communique by the World Association of Psychoanalysis. Quote, the World Association of Psychoanalysis through the voice of its president and its international council affirms its total solidarity with the Israeli people, victims of massacres of civilians on a mass scale accompanied by the kidnapping of women and children held hostage. Irrespective of any political context, these practices are indisputably terrorist in nature and amount to crimes against humanity. It is therefore our duty to condemn here and now without any yes but the Hamas organization responsible for the execution, if not the conception of this infamous plan. Our thoughts are with our Israeli colleagues, members of the World Association of Psychoanalysis and the New Lacanian Society, and we send them our unconditional support in the ordeal their country is going through. Elsewhere, Stephen and I have noted that far from far before the global transformation of Islamophobia as a blatantly racist discourse, 
into a sanctioned political analysis, Derrida approached the global reach and relevance of psychoanalysis very carefully, understanding how its deployment, quote, may serve as a conduit for these new forms of violence. He warns that psychoanalysis, quote, is in danger of becoming nothing more than a perverse and sophisticated appropriation of violence, or at best, merely a new weapon in the symbolic arsenal, end quote. Derrida's remarks were made in reference to the recently ratified constitution of the International Psychoanalytic Association, which made a similar statement of this nature that I read, where the association's geographical areas were defined at that time as North America, north of the United States Mexican border, all American America south of that border, and quote, the rest of the world, which Derrida remarked quote, connotes all that virgin psychoanalysis, to put it bluntly, has never set foot in, end quote. The rest of the world in the IPA's constitution, Derrida observes, is, quote, thus a title, name, and location that lies beyond the boundaries of psychoanalysis, which has yet to be opened. It therefore is a foreign body named, incorporated, and circumscribed ahead of time by an IPA constitution rehearsing, as it were, the psychoanalytic colonization of a non-American rest of the world, the conquest of a virginity parenthetically married to Europe, end quote. Rather than releasing Derrida from the sexist and cis-heteronormative metaphor that he instrumentalizes, I'm thinking about for a moment to think that this formulation is precisely to a particular form of normative reproduction of psychoanalytic theory, which I'll go into a little bit more with the specifics in the context of Palestine. Derrida identifies psychoanalysis as invasive. It has a missionary repetition compulsion, one that aims to colonize the bodies of others in order to establish sovereignty over the universality of the psyche. What's important for our talk today here is that the IPA's constitution of, of, of which Derrida was pointing to was ratified in Jerusalem in 1977, a city under internationally recognized occupation. This makes us consider then that even which foreign bodies become identifiable, categorizable and recognizable, let alone worthy of receiving the conquest of psychoanalysis, of course, readily imagining and disimagining who psychoanalysis is worthy to treat. I give my talk then in this context as what's folding and, and unfolding in Palestine and the sordid history that psychoanalysis has in the colonizing and settler colonial project. I'll introduce my talk, why it's important in the current sociopolitical moment. And then most importantly, I will uplift the words of Palestine, a Palestinian clinician with whom I've worked alongside and who Stephen and I document in our book. Some of you might have heard parts of this through, uh, through other talks or have read the book yourself, but I'm hopeful that we can still find something new that emerges in our communal space together. And I would really hope that you hold in mind what's happening right now as I read the words and, and sort of uh, relate to you the story from Palestine. So in Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon and his character characteristically unrelenting clarity states, quote, in this work, I have made it a point to convey the misery of the black man physically and affectively. I've not wished to be objective. Besides that would be dishonest. It's not possible for me to be objective, end quote. Likewise for me, it's not possible for me to be objective. This acknowledgement of lack of objectivity, far from being enough to counter the ongoing wreck wrecking effects of settler colonialism, is for our purposes today understood as a small and necessary act of reclaiming disavowed truths, as well as attending to the textured violence of racial history in the United States settler colony, as well as a settler colony of the state now known as Israel. Truths and history that through innocence, especially as articulated by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, conveniently become displaced and disappeared. This disappearance, a disavowal in psychoanalytic terms, maintains a particular social order while hiding the mechanisms by which that order is maintained. The act of reclaiming disavowed truths and unabashedly naming them as such is the method by which I heed Fanon's call and attempt to counter in real time the perniciousness of what 
Stephen and I have come to understand as psychoanalytic innocence, which I'll speak to a little later. Objectivity, as it's encoded into psychoanalysis, of which neutrality is a subset, is one such valve of innocence, something that Fanon very early on was working to shift in psychoanalysis to include a sustained engagement with sociogeny and then, of course, the revolutionary struggle for liberation. This framework, as I've come to understand and practices, practice it has at its core a militant disruption of the violence done by seemingly innocent psychoanalytic praxis and theory, heeding the call to practice what Glenn Coltard in Red Skin, White Masks has termed, quote, a politicized anger and a disciplined maintenance of resentment, end quote. Not as a deflection from the depth work of psychoanalysis, but rather as a contingency for vibrant livability in the face of oppressive structures, as my Palestinian scholar and sister and comrade Nad Nadira Shalhoub Kavrukian reminds us. And I'd like us to think about this life and livability uh, in just position to what uh, Heike Shoten has told us about who comes to live life and who, of course, is a uh, is sort of doesn't hold life dear. Again, something we're, we're seeing in real time unfold. It's fitting then that, and, and talk about psychoanalysis under occupation, especially with the settler colonial condition in Palestine, that I reject objectivity and embrace the Fanonian methodology of militancy in speaking to Palestinian presence, sumud or stalwartness in the face of Zionist violence. In this way, I myself refuse to collude with psychoanalytic innocence. The concept of psychoanalytic innocence emerges from our book, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation, and while the concepts underlines its ubiquity in the field of psychoanalysis, as you just heard from the two statements that I read, the book, uh, we used it to discuss the way psychoanalytic theory and practice can work in servants of violence in the context of the settler colonial condition in Palestine. For example, we tend to how ideologically psychoanalysis insists on dialogue, reason, and working through without a sustained analysis of the material conditions of dispossession in Palestine and acts under the pretense, not only of neutrality and objectivity, but also universalism, empathy as an endpoint of process, and the myth of safety. We name how in this context, psychoanalytic innocence works in concert with the logics of settler colonialism and occupation, denying the everyday violence enacted on Palestinians and conveniently forgetting how this is also structured by the unconscious. Deployed in this way, psychoanalytic innocence is particularly insidious because it simultaneously forfeits psychoanalysis supposition of unconscious process and structure while also ignoring material reality. Psychoanalytic innocence is not understood as an intrapsychic process. It, just, it doesn't happen just inside that disrupts the analyst's thinking, but rather as an innocence that pervades the ideological position of the practice, the theory, and therefore the relational space of psychoanalysis. That is why in the book and here today, I want to center the work and practice of sumud and resistance by our clinician colleague who generously shared of herself just like others did in the book. As in other examples of the book, the clinical case I'm platforming today is a jumping off point. Rather than engaging in a maneuver of psychoanalytic innocence where the content alone comes to hold the energetic pull of clinical attention, I want us to focus on how the clinical work that Ya'ad does comes to be both a space for resistance for her patients and also an extension of her own resistance against settler colonial hegemony. Indeed, what we consistently came upon in our work alongside our colleagues was that a collective practice is unified through precisely its engagement with creating and maintaining life and life worlds, counter to everything that we've been hearing about the deathscape that is planted by Palestinians. It's about creating life as well as political and historical realities for Palestinians by Palestinians. So the following clinical example was shared with us by Yoad Ghanadri Hakim, a brilliant clinician and a revolutionary soul with captive citizenship in the Zionist state. After meeting Yoad, we continued to have conversations with her and witnessed her speaking publicly and in psychoanalytic groups over subsequent years, conversations that only increased our admiration for her critical insights and her depths of empathy. One particular case she shared with us is that of Amjad 
a man in his early 30s who worked in an Israeli textile company inside the 1948 borders of the state now known as, as Israel. Though he had a home in the West Bank, Amjad, along with his three children and wife, who was a homemaker, rented a house in an officially annexed village near Kalandia out of fear of losing his, quote, identity card that allowed him to live and work in Jerusalem. Amjad visited the clinic where Yoad worked as he suffered from sensations of a lump or a ball in his throat whenever he became nervous. Amjad had undergone many medical tests to establish treatment for what he felt was a medical condition, though each medical consultation indicated that his throat was, quote, 100% normal. After a year, one of Amjad's physicians suggested he seek help from a psychologist. He was initially very embarrassed in the clinical space with Yad and found difficulty speaking about himself as well as anything beyond what he felt must be a medical condition. He explained that there were days when he felt the ball in his throat was getting bigger, while other days he felt it getting smaller. Yad asked him to share with her his reflections and observations about what sometimes made the pain increase to such a degree he was barely able to speak. He would tell her, quote, my words stop in my throat. They knot up and become a ball in my throat. They suffocate me when they do not come out, end quote. Amjad was annoyed with himself. She also, and Yad felt the ball move from his throat into her stomach, a knot she could not release. Amjad's therapy with Yad lasted approximately one and a half years of weekly sessions. She reported initially having been supervised by an Israeli Jewish psychologist. Yad noted that while the lore of the institution at which she worked was such that everyone held themselves to professional standards and believed in the fundamental premise of psychoanalytic theory and practice, she often sensed this collapse of psychic space when her Israeli supervisors, especially in the case of Amjad, tried to theorize Palestinian patients seen by Palestinian clinicians. In the case of Amjad, rather than being curious about the psychoanalytic meanings of Amjad's symptoms, the supervisor insisted that Amjad suffered from a behavioral anxiety disorder that, and that only medication could solve his problem. Yad felt deeply conflicted by this assessment as she relayed her attuned clinical intuition that Amjad likely had much more to say. She feared that medicine would potentially preemptively shut Amjad and his exploratory process down and foreclose opportunities to collaboratively read the symptoms as signs of a deeper communication about his experience and being. Yad recalled disagree disagreeing with her supervisor openly, despite being painfully aware of the power differential and the potential implications of doing so. She insisted that she should continue to be curious with Amjad about what he was trying to communicate in the displacement, in counter-transference, and in the dyad, even if this was not explicitly articulated. This, of course, represented an alignment with a psychoanalytic tradition and technique in which she and her supervisor were trained. Despite this, her supervisor insisted on psychiatric intervention, and therefore Yad suggested that Amja consult a psychiatrist, an intervention that pacified her supervisor, but which Amja refused. Yad often also had the feeling of the room being heavy with thoughts and words that were left unsaid, though they were very much present. In this, she reflected how both silence and speech can be defensive, used to fill up the space, but never reaching the depths of the patient or the clinician. Her supervisor dismissed concerns that Yad brought up, her countertransference, and her concern that the ball in Amjad's throat lightened as he spoke, but immediately returned and grew whenever the session ended. She felt that she and Amjad were playing a game of negotiation, and yet in reality, there was no solution. Yad was confronted with conflicts regarding how to speak about the work with Amjad and supervision. She noted the psychoanalytic importance of having associated two negotiations, especially in the context of Palestine. While she understood intuitively that associations had meaning, especially in the countertransference, Yad found herself at a loss of how to express this concern to her supervisor, especially as the supervisor did not share Yad's concerns. Amjad himself was happy that he did not feel any discomfort in his throat during the sessions. However, he stated that outside the clinic, his painful feelings returned and he was unable to get rid of the ball. Yad asked him to put aside the distracting notes he had taken to bringing into session 
and talk about his difficulty breathing in real time with specific focus on when he was feeling suffocated. He told her that his feeling of suffocation increases and when it increases, it turns into a ball in his throat that suffocates him fully. Yad worked with Amjad to uncover and recount all the moments in which he had felt suffocated. When his wife reminding him of payments for the pathetic car he had bought, when he passed in front of his closed house in the West Bank, when his Israeli boss asked him to bring him fresh olive oil from their tree in the West Bank, when he entered the area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, and he read the sign, no crossing border, dangerous area. In every session after that pivotal moment, Amja talked about the specifics of his breathing difficulties and sighed a lot as he did so. At this point, her supervisor indicated abruptly that it was time for Yuad to end Amjad's treatment because she was happy with the achievement he had made and felt there was no further growth or depth to explore. Yuad remembered feeling very upset about this decision, especially as she had just started to experience an important affective shift in the room. Because in the moment she felt she did not have the power to do otherwise, she initially followed her supervisor's advice and told Amjad that they needed to end their therapy. She recounted how Amjad exploded, shouting in a way that she could never have previously imagined from this soft-spoken man. While, ye while yelling, Amjad told her that she was weak and that, quote, she was not the one who owns the decision or the decision-making process accusing her of, quote, not really being concerned with taking care of and protecting sick people, end quote. Yuad remembers being shocked by the fact that he was screaming, and yet she did not fully understand what was happening, nor did she have the space to reflect fully about her counter-transference. Counter but one thing that she remembers feeling is that she felt very happy. She felt happy that he was finding voice after this moment, Yuad made the decision to continue Amjad's treatment alone without consulting her supervisor any further. During this phase of treatment, Amjad started talking about anger. More specifically, he spoke about getting angry inside his car, the lousy car in which he crossed the Kalendia checkpoint twice a day, once on his way to work and once on his way back. Amjad reported getting angry in his car whenever he read the word Ma'bar, checkpoint crossing, on a sign. He reported feeling angry because he did not feel like he was just crossing from one area to another. Rather, he felt that he was inside one space but was prohibited from free movement in another while standing at a checkpoint. This is Amjad. Why do they call it a crossing? This is a checkpoint, a checkpoint, it's a checkpoint. In a session soon after he began to uncover his anger, Yuad reminded him that they had not spoken about the ball in his throat for quite some time now, inquiring where it was and if it remained a symptom for him. She recalled Amjad stating, quote, sometimes I feel that there is hate or hatefulness in my throat and not a ball. This is when Yuad decided to ask him who he hated, to which he responded, I hate myself. After a moment of silence, Yuad said Amjad opened up about an incident that had happened two years prior. He reported taking his seven-year-old daughter in the morning with him on his way to work as she'd wanted to meet with a friend in Jerusalem. He remembered that his daughter was very happy that morning as she'd been fantasizing about this magical day with her friend for quite some time. He recalled that she wore a beautiful new dress the night before out of excitement and put flowers in her hair the morning they set out. Amjad further shared that his daughter was singing throughout the trip in the car, in Arabic, but I'm translating it, bouncy, bouncy, bouncy ball, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. When they reached the Kalendia checkpoint, Amjad was surprised to see her tear gas and a confrontation between the occupation army and prote protesters. Worried about his daughter, he tried to reverse, but his car was stuck in the midst of hundreds of cars, all trapped, motionless. The situation was increasingly frightful, frightful for about 15 minutes, after which it completely calmed down, but the occupation soldiers closed the checkpoint and prevented the cars from moving. Amjad recalled that his daughter had begun to cry uncontrollably during this time, that he was hugging her the entire time, trying to calm her and contain her fear. 
Eventually, she told her father she needed to use the bathroom. Amjad was not convinced that they would allow access to a bathroom, but got out of his car to inquire as his daughter's crying was escalating and he could tell she was in considerable discomfort. Amjad told Yuad that he waved down a settler soldier, telling him, my daughter needs a bathroom. Instead of responding to him, the soldiers ran towards him with their weapons raised. And he said, I raised my hands towards the sky and shouted at them. She wants a bathroom. Please let me pass. The settler soldiers yelled, get back in your car. Get back. Get in the car. Tell your daughter to piss herself in the car. All the while, his daughter continued to cry. Baba, I need a bathroom. Amjad recalled getting back in his car, hugging his daughter, and with a trembling voice telling her, do it here, Baba. Do it quietly here in the car. He remembered how at that moment, his daughter's screaming stopped as the smell of urine spread in the car. Amjad looked at his daughter and found, found her shedding silent tears. He hugged her as he drove them home. And as he looked at the checkpoint gate, he remembered the cheerful song of his daughter at the beginning of the day, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. We're not you, ball, after which he immediately felt a ball stuck in his throat. Yoad remembered how Amjad finished describing the incident and witnessed tears flowing down his cheeks for the first time. She remembered tears rolling down her cheeks as well as she became aware of a wheel in her own throat. This case is important for many reasons, not the least of which is the distilling of the banality of violence enacted daily on Palestinians, whether patients or clinicians. And again, this is why I led with what I did and asked us to hold that in mind. Yoad tells us that Amjad's treatment was one that she will never forget in her life. She confides in us saying, I often remember Amjad. He guides me professionally and privately. It changed me in the way that I practice. The effect of this case on Yaad is what we focus, what I focus on here and in our book. It encapsulates the condition of the Palestinian as an extension into the clinical and the clinical into the personal and the social. But more specifically, it allows us an opportunity to acknowledge how Palestinian clinicians refuse to erase the signs of Zionist settler colonialism embodied in the clinical space, both in the therapist and the patient, no matter the systemic pressure or the demands from supervisors or from international organizations, for example, to reduce them into primarily behavioral beings with no depth and interiority. In a depoliticized condition, one might say that Amjad physiological symptoms are experienced physically without any medical basis. The Israeli supervisor identifies the symptom as a conversion symptom, as a symptom of an anxiety disorder. She sees him as primarily as a resistant patient who refuses to speak, to articulate thoughts, or to open up and be honest. We call this ideological misattunement that saturates psychoanalytic thought, analysis, and treatment an inability to identify processes precisely because the analyst or clinician is implicated by and imbricated in the ideological matrix in which the patient is also entangled. This exemplifies psychoanalytic innocence. To bring it back to our talk today and to what is happening in real time in Palestine, I would especially like to draw our attention to how liberal and humanistic psychoanalysis maintains this ideological naturalization and misattunement, remaining complicit through forms of oppression by seeking to graph a universalized healthy adaptability onto colonial and racialized subjects whose humanity and psychic interiority are negated. In a liberalized version of psychoanalytic theory, these colonial subjects are only able to access empathy when they occupy the position of victim and surrender their rights to experience political and material realities in full alignment with their experience and social context or in terms of their will to live and liberate themselves. Yoad's supervisor attempts to mobilize psychoanalytic innocence and like all of the Palestinian clinicians, uh, clinicians alongside whom we, we learned, Yoad was a willful subject engaging in the politics of refusal, a Palestinian clinician unwilling to succumb to the colonial violence inflicted on her as a clinician, nor on her patient Amjad. 
a Palestinian clinician insisting on indigenous Palestinian presence, even in the face of settler aggression that insists on erasing the native. To the Israeli settler, in this case, a supervisor, Amjad's silence could only be a defense, a deflection from confronting the unconscious. Without attending to the structural and material realities of his world as a Palestinian, she reads his symptoms as just nerves, anxiety that can be medicated. If we were to collude with psychoanalytic innocence, we might mistake this supervisor's racist and colonial aggression as a disaggregated singular act of random violence, rather than an essential part of a coordinated system of violence, oppression, and erasure per perpetrated by the settler state of Israel, here manifesting in the supervisory space. In this way, Yuad also alerts us to the importance of the Palestinian body, individually and collectively, as a site of violence, as well as a site of resistance and sociability. The somatization, for example, feeling the ball in the throat is not a symptom of a disorder. Rather, it's a symptom of functioning within material reality that stops up the flow of the unconscious, the social and the intersubjective. His symptom confronted and read through the context of Palestinian intersubjectivity does not only direct us to the settler colonial condition, but also makes us consider how the occupation may manifest, manifest itself or perhaps can only manifest itself within the context of Palestinian masculinity here, for example, through somatization. Otherwise it might be dismissed or minimalized. My own additional reading as a clinician is that the supervisor felt compelled to stop Amjad from speaking, lest he disclose the realities of violence being done to him by the Israeli state with which she was so identified. Indeed, there's no place for a Palestine speaking subject in the settler colonial regime. The suffocating ball itself is not the only symptom, something which you had recognized as a Palestinian colonial subject clinician. In this way, the symptoms were hyper visible to her, to Yohad, but the symptoms were illegible to the ideologically misattuned Israeli supervisor. The symptom of silence and empty speech signified the loss of the ability to speak deeply in Yohad's language, to articulate meaning, as well as a blockage to affectively express the damage inflicted on the interior self by the daily violence of occupation. We can then understand Yohad's decision to continue working with him, despite her supervisor indicating she shouldn't, as a liberatory and ethical imperative that most movingly disrupts the settler's insistence on futurity. In making this decision, Yohad demonstrates that she saw his symptoms as a checkpoint, a hajiz, a barrier, just as he did, just as we do in the everyday life of Palestinians, just as all our clinician colleagues tell us. In this way, Yoad, as well as her patients, actively disrupt settler colonial logic and insist on indigenous presence, life making. Just a couple final words before I wrap up. It's important to note that the central point of our book is how Palestinian clinicians and Palestine, Palestinians themselves not only work to resist settler colonial hegemony, but how their work is an affirmation of Palestinian life and lives. The psychic political economy of life defies being objectified as victim. It struggles to maintain, even though at times tragic, desperate, and to some heroic ways, dignity, commitment, and responsibility to themselves as individuals and communities. We build on the insights of Nadira Shalhub Kavarkian about how psychic political power emanating from, quote, sites of death generate a collective psychosocial embodiment of everyday resistance. More specifically, we identify how the psychosocial practices of Palestinians through the experiences through psychoanalysis and the technique of clinicians, affirm the centrality of the embodied psyche, al nafs, as the primary site for Palestinian life, willfulness, and resistance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shehan. That was um, really informative. And admittedly, as an attorney, it, it took me to a different discipline 
as I was trying to understand kind of the experiences of that context through a psychoanalyst's uh, expertise. And so I will encourage our audience to uh, put questions in the Q&A, which I will moderate. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you kind of the question that I'm sure you've been asked many times just because of the reality that we're living through today is as you're seeing what's happening in Gaza and in Israel, uh, as a psychoanalyst, what are kind of the ideas or thoughts that are coming to your mind based on your research? What what can we learn from your expertise um, in, in terms of the, the mental health uh, context? Right. Thank you for that question. I will say that I think there's, you know, I, I learned from my Palestinian colleagues on the ground and certainly in continued work with them. Um, I want to direct folks also to the Palestine Global Mental Health Network that is very active and uh, unifies clinicians across historic Palestine, right? They defy the borders of the settler colonial regime and say, you know, we're, we're no longer in need of theorizing from whether it's, uh, you know, generous Israelis or folks coming from outside that don't speak the language, that don't know the history, that are not indigenous to this land, to understand the specificities of being a Palestinian and what that means, both in the context of patient work and then uh, of patients themselves and then of the clinicians themselves as well. So I would really point you to their work and, and the, the political positions that they take and, and the asks that they have of us. And so I think that is where I would start is if we were to think about, you know, I, I approach this work from my ethical duty as a clinician. And our ethical duty is to ensure the psychic well-being of people. We don't get to choose who those people are. It's an ethical imperative of ours to support people who are fighting for their self-determination, for their liberation, and for uh, their psychic, as Fanon would say, their connection to their land. And I think there's something really important about that, about not shying away. What many folks will say is, you know, stay in your lane, you're an analyst, <laughs> or you're a, psycho, you're a psychoanalyst, or you're a clinician. And what I would say is that if we are invested in the psychic well-being of people, we must be attentive to the structural conditions that create the possibility of suffering. And in the context of Palestine, what creates the possibility and the conditions of suffering has been 75 years of settler colonialism, and we need to name that. Everything else is treating a symptom, right? If we're treating a root, if psychoanalysis can hold itself to its theories, can take itself seriously, can really cash out on its promises, can be anti-oppressive in the way that it takes up these issues, then it must start there. I think we can't be afraid of reclaiming these disavowals. I started off with an, an, an anecdote saying, we need to reclaim disavowals. The psychic process that allows us to continue every single day, splitting off what the actual roots of psychic suffering are in the context of Palestine is precisely what causes suffering, right? So I, I think that's, that's part of it is that we, we must truth tell, right? Uh, the word, Folks often use the word gaslighting. That is true, right? We, we, we can't engage in that. But we also have to go further and take stances and not take these cowardly stances that we see now from psychoanalytic institutes or organizations that effectively say that psychoanalysis is the purview of only some people and that we're not concerned, actually. There are people, just like Derrida was saying, is like it's... We understand who the pe who people worthy of treating and caring for are and who the rest of the world is. And in this case, the rest of the world happens to be Palestine. Is that, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's so difficult to just have a conversation about Palestine without uh, being uh, automatically accused of being anti-Semitic, without automatically being accused of supporting Hamas, um, and without even just having a civil conversation so that we can understand the different 
perspectives and the different perspectives within the different perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to homogenize Palestinians. We don't want to homogenize Jews or Israelis or Muslims or Arabs. And so uh, in many ways, this lecture series and the Center for Security, Race and Rights is intended to try to at least provide the perspectives of those that are rarely, uh, whether because of who they are or because of the perspectives they bring are rarely included right in mainstream conversations, uh, notwithstanding that what they have to say is, is highly relevant and, and thoughtful. So with that, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Lara Shihi. Uh, and I want to encourage everybody who attended, thank you for attending, please follow us on social media. And if you strongly support our work, we welcome you making a donation at csrr.rutgers.edu and follow us on social media, R-U-C-S-R-R and Rutgers CSRR. Our next uh, lecture is going to feature Khaled Beydoun, who is going to be giving a talk on his latest book, uh, Global Islamophobia, and it will be in November. So stay tuned. And you can always uh, check up on our website to get more information. But with that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Shiha, and thank you everyone for attending. And inshallah, we will, we will, everyone <laughs> will find peace, and and we'll just keep trying to to do the best we can um, to make the best of of a very difficult reality. So thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you for inviting me, and I really appreciate. It. Thank you, everybody who's in attendance. Masalim. Masalim.